were the plays on fire that we saw. Anna Tavir Smith's Fire in the Mirror is back at the signature with Michael Benjamin Washington as a solo performer recounting the Crown Heights riots from 1991 when Gavin Cato, a seven-year-old boy, was accidentally killed by the Grand Rebbe Schneerson's motorcade and to make matters worse, a group of black teens deliberately killed innocent Yankel Rosenbaum who was just walking nearby. And Michael Benjamin Washington was brilliant, going from characters and with the props and everything else. And you have like uh, actors like Al Sharpton, the residents, the Lubavitcher black residents talking. These are actual interviews that she did. And the relatives of Cato and Rosenbaum. And this was very compelling, the arguments and everything. And, and it was very Rashomon because the blacks felt the Jews didn't care and um, and the blacks thought, and the Jews thought they did everything they could to help save this little boy. And it made me think of, like, the killing right now in Jersey City and false news. And it was just, I just wish the ending hadn't been so biased. It felt biased towards anti-Semitism more than, you know, than a fair, like, recounting of the events. It, it was inflammatory. But I'm still giving it a happy face, minus, minus four. It could have had a more neutral ending, I felt. Arthur Miller's uh, uh, epic play, Crucible, uh, produced by a Badlam company, it's, a, it's a, a, interesting. It was based on a, on a real event of witchcraft which happened in Salem in 1692, and Arthur Miller ended up writing the play in the mid-1950s. And how relevant it is today. It is about this, uh, some, some young girls were dancing in the forest and perhaps naked. And then, you know, like uh, the Puritanical Society of New England, it's just like they think the devil has come in them. And then these girls are pretending that, yeah, devil is in them, and this person is a devil, and this person, and they're involving lots of innocent people, in, uh, including mm. Elizabeth Proctor and John Proctor, into this witch trial. And we should say that also that this, like you said, it's written in the 1950s, and this is Arthur Miller's uh, answer to McCarthyism right. and naming names, and there was a whole witch hunt against so-called communists, against writers and actors, and the whole blacklist and all that. Yeah, this stimulated him actually to write this play, because he mm. was himself part of that, uh, mm. he, he was questioned mm. in that committee. But it's interesting that this play makes you think about Me Too, and women empowerment, and uh, horrible teenagers, and, and how they, you know, go and shoot people these days. It, it brings up a lot of different issues, not just one. And now you want to talk about yeah, the uncomfortableness of the Yeah, theater. because you see, the thing is this, I mean, the one more thing, because the innocent people are being uh, convicted and it's just like in a way today it's also the same kind of things happening That's okay true so so the, you know the production is is supposed to be very chaotic because it's in the script but the play is being directed physically in a very chaotic way people running by we, Eric Tucker yeah we are all on stage you know like uh, and and then there are a lot of actors, they're very energetic, and they're running around carrying furniture, carrying lights in their hands with long cords, and it's kind of physical, a little bit, I felt a little dangerous. And then I have a little problem with my eye, that's why I'm wearing glasses. So the she light was eye really, really fixed, as if it was fixed for me. And I had a real problem for last half hour or something. So it was, but but the play was very well done, And but I think it, they should cut out some of those the, the dangerous kind of elements well, in the production. Well, see, maybe that's why this was the most exciting crucible I have ever seen. It's like, yes, the light was shining in my eye, and I had a fan in front of my face the entire time, and yes, I was more listening than watching it, and yes, the actors were like in my face, yes, the seats were uncomfortable, but the thing is, in this case, usually I'm distracted by all that, but this was so exciting and suspenseful, and I got so much out of it that I've never done before. I freaking hate this play. Uh, I was really, you know, like, wow, I never thought I'd like The Crucible. But I got to say, you know, don't sit don't sit in the front. You want to sit in the audience part yeah, of it. Yeah, I think that would have been much better. That would have right. been much better. And the, and the thing is, uh, someone yeah. from the company came up afterwards and was concerned, like, we saw that the lights were, were apologized. Do you want to come back and see it again in a better situation? So they are aware that we were uncomfortable. No, no, I understand that, but my problem was so, if you get distracted, then you lose the play. That's the opposite view. Yeah. And, you know, like, I, I just kind of start worrying about my foot, my leg, my eye, and I was just, like, lost some part of it. But uh, mixed for me. And happy face, minus for the uncomfortableness of it. Mixed for me. 
with a little help, it's John Belushi. It's written and by Jack Zulo and directed by Levi, Levy Lee Simon. And I gotta say, Jack Zulo, who also performs as John Belushi, is a dead ringer, forgive the pun, for John Belushi. I mean, he really captures that exuberant, over-the-top, obnoxious quality of John Belushi. And this is a really great backstory, how he goes from class clown to SNL fame. And for fans of Belushi, great band. Oh my gosh, that band is fantastic. And this is incredible harmonica playing. You get to see Gilda and Dan and all those Saturday Night Live people. And Brian Murray and the Blues Brothers and Samurai Chef, they all make an appearance. So you should have a pretty enjoyable time. So I'm giving it a mixed face plus. National Yiddish Volksbein Company presents The Sorceress at the, Ju the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Battery Park in Manhattan. So basically the story is about this sorceress who goes around and she, she, she sees these neighbors. One neighbor is this very happy family. The, the family is very close. The daughter is, you know, beloved. And then the neighbors are miserable and poor. And so she decides to make the happy family miserable and the miserable family happy by killing off the wife so that he marries this miserable woman and her daughter. It's almost like a Cinderella stepsister story. And how this miserable family where she makes all these terrible things happen and the sorceress being in cahoots with the evil second wife. But is she really a sorceress or is she just a, a, a meddlesome woman? I mean, you never know if she's real or not. You know, she really, I mean, you think she is because in the beginning she does sorceressy things, but then she keeps claiming she's not a sorceress. I absolutely agree. Um, I thought that this play was uh, it was wonderful because of the pageantry, and it is a musical. Um, and I thought they did a great job on hitting all of these beats. Um, as a musical, it has uh, strange melodies and that and and uh, weird um, you know world music that you might not necessarily hear in a, a normal Broadway musical. So I thought it was great. I gave it a happy face. Plus, yeah. Oh, the acting is fantastic. Everything about this, you're just gonna you're gonna excel and love it. And yes, there's some illogical points to it, but then you know this is a fairy tale and it's silly and it's you know it's it's a Yiddish it's Yiddish theater. So I loved it. I think we're in agreement then. Anything can happen in the musical theater. The, in the, the anything can happen in the theater. The musical world of Maury Yeston is a sleek presentation of Maury Yeston's oeuvre, ranging from his well-known shows like Nine, Titanic, Grand Hotel, and Phantom of the Opera, to lesser-known shows like Death Takes a Holiday, December Songs, In the Beginning, and The Queen of Basin, as well as some never-before-heard so, before heard songs, brand-new songs, and trunk songs. And the ensemble of Benjamin Eakley, Giovanna Sean, Alex Gatlin, Justin Keyes, and Mamie Paris really know how to sell a song. I bought every nuance, emotions, and winks they delivered. There is a lot to celebrate from Halloween to the Mardi Gras Ball. I can tell you what happens in this theater. You are going to feel like you have come home. And this um, was at the York Theater. And, oh my gosh, there's way more on Facebook and also on Facebook and on YouTube. You can see my entire press conference, musical numbers from Anything Can Happen. So go to YouTube, Eva Heinemann, and find everything you need there. While Parrots of Campbell is now playing at the Cherry Lane Theater in the West Village. And it is an excellent play. I like this play very much. The plot tells the story of two brothers, Charlie and Jack, who have to decide whether they want to keep living in their house, as, which they're using as a group house after their mom died before the events of the play. Um, their mom's pet parrot escaped and became feral and appears off stage, which is a uh, theme and a metaphor for the entire play. I thought this play was really good. Um, they have uh, the two brothers and another two roommates plus uh, the younger brother Charlie's girlfriend and all four of them all five of the characters interact and fight during the play. Um, on the downside the play eschews um, politics and morality in order to just observe these Millennials uh, complaining to each other <laughs> and so and so that's for better and worse so 
Uh, one of the millennial characters is working too hard, that's Charlie, where his uh, older brother isn't working at all. And so these two millennials are kind of two sides of the, of the coin. Um, but instead of talking about the financial crisis in 2008, um, or the opiates crisis that's going on right now, um, the writer and director just kind of skip those things. Uh, it works to the benefit of the play, but um, people looking for politics and morality have to go to a, another production. Not this okay, one. So you give it a... I definitely give it a happy face plus um, before it's lighthearted and steady look at millennials. One November Yankee uh, is written and directed by Joshua Rebich. It involves three sets of siblings. In this case, we heard about brothers. This case, we got a brother and a sister and their contentious relationship and a very important plane crash. And despite some slight illogical flaws, this was funny, moving, and thoughtful play with the remarkable prose of Harry Hamlin after over two decades is back on the New York stage. I used to go see him in D.C. and Princeton. I mean, he's such a good actor. And Stephanie Powers. I mean, we love Stephanie Powers. And in each manifestation, I truly believe that they really were a brother and sister who had an unbreakable bond in the midst of their lives crashing and possibly burning. In the first one, he's an artist, and she had commissioned him because she belongs to this great museum, and it's inspired by this plane crash of a brother and sister. Then we see the brother and sister that were in the plane crash, and then finally we see the hikers that find the plane crash. And I just found One November Yankee is one hell of a play, more on Facebook, but oh my God, you do not want to miss this one. Jen Ewing saw Knife Edge Productions' uh, presentation of Neil Labute's In a Dark, Dark House, which is produced and directed by Sam Helfrich. It's a toxic masculinity play about two brothers. One, the younger one is in a rehab facility. The older one comes to visit him there. And the younger one's determined to do whatever he needs to to stay out of prison. And it seems to be to the detriment of the older. Both were molested when they were much younger, and you have to see the play to find out how they reacted to it. Um, Jan felt its captivating story, extraordinary acting. He gave it happy face plus. More on Facebook. More on Facebook. From Brothers to Mappy and Schmalpy and Shire's uh, revision of Baby about these three couples trying to start a family. So hopefully there will be lots of brothers and sisters running around. This is based upon a story developed by Susan Yankovich, and this was directed and choreographed by Ethan Paulini. And this is uh, site-specific because we're in this really tiny apartment, and the, the actors are in our laps, but unlike Crucible, you don't feel in any danger. And <laughs> the, what happens when they discover they're pregnant, and this couple trying to get pregnant, and this older couple is surprised by pregnancy? They're all surprised, except for one couple that really want to get pregnant. With an amazing cast, I mean... Alice Ripley and Evan Ruggiero are like two of my favorite people in the world. Yeah, it's um, the older couple already have raised three kids and now they're faced with this decision, you know, do they want to do it again? There's a um, couple in the middle that are in this production a lesbian couple, but I think they must have been originally male and female. And it becomes very confusing if they're supposed to be two women or a man and a woman. I don't think they fully worked out how that should go, but the performers are so brilliant mm. that I began not to care about that. Exactly. And then there's a, a college-age couple just beginning to live together that um, she's not sure she wants any full commitment. She's just willing to be with him. But the baby might change everything like babies always do. And, and for all of them, it's like, yes. you know, what's going to happen to them? I mean, major happy face. Yeah, no, this is a fantastic show and a brilliant production. And I want to applaud Out of the Box Productions for doing this kind of extraordinary apartment theater. <laughs> Sasha Clark and I both saw A Chris Dinkins' A Christmas Carol. This is adapted by Jack Thorne and directed by Matthew Warches. 
And this production from the Old Vic features a new adaptation of an old chestnut. It warms your heart and is a perfect antidote to the often stressed out holidays. And get there early because they throw out treats of oranges and cookies to you. And there's wonderful music. And you, you there's it's interactive in every nook and cranny. You're totally involved and engaged in the story of, of mean old Ebenezer who refuses to believe Marley's ghost telling him that if he doesn't change his miserly ways, he will end up in the grave unloved and destroyed and of course we get the ghost of Christmas past which is Andrea Martin and present which is LaChance and the future and the entire company with lanterns everywhere it really is just the most fabulous and there's more of an Ebenezer backstory and the ending is tweaked a little different than what you're used to it, it's a wonderful it's like the best Christmas carol I've ever seen and let's face it there are a million Christmas carols out there much more on Facebook from both of us but we both just love this to pieces do treat yourself and your family and friends to this magical charmer not to be missed. On the other hand, you have Every Christmas Ever Told and Then Some, created by Michael Carlton, James Fitzgerald, and John K. Elvis. It's the funniest, joyous experience you'll have this Christmas season. Cameron is say only wants to perform a Christmas carol as they rehearsed, but the other two actors involved mutinied on the Yuletide. They were sick of a Christmas carol. It's been done to death. So... Margaret Hobson doled out interesting Santa Claus facts from around the world with dire consequences for bad little kids. This made Adam Davlin especially happy as the sweet naive fellas still believe in Santa Claus. But in between scenes of The Grinch, Rudolph the TV version, Frost the Snowman, Gift to the Mad Guy, Cameron kept trying to sneak in Scrooge. Even the obligatory fruitcake made an appearance. If more cast members were required for their stories, they plumbed the audience to help out. The second act saw a mashup of Christmas Carol with a wonderful life that was comic <laughs> silver and gold. Scrooge turning into Jimmy Stewart? Priceless. Then we got a quick succession of Christmas songs. I was either laughing my stockings off or grinning from ear to ear. Adam Devil and Cameron say Margaret Margarin Hobson played so well off each other despite their different personality traits which really made it a treat. Angela Davlin directed these zany trios with obvious glee. Every Christmas story ever told and then some will put you in the um, holiday spirit more than a cup of eggnog. Beaming happy face. The, you got to see this to believe this. I mean, what they do with Frost's Snowman, I left, I peed my pants. At the 14th Street Y, I saw a golem from Buenos Aires written, directed, and choreographed by Karina Toker, and art and scenic design by Mirta Kupferman. And it um, went very briefly through the original story about uh, the Golem from Prague created by Rabbi Lowe, and that's a creature from clay that was supposed to protect the Jewish people of the ghetto, but gets out of hand. To a much happier story about one of um, the rabbi's descendants who travels with his wife um, to resettle in Buenos Aires, finds a mini golem in one of the rabbi's old books and creates a helper figure from that um, and is also able to teach the golem in addition to doing housework to read, write, create poetry. And the golem has a very happy friendship with a local girl next from the neighborhood. It's very sweet, maybe a little too sweet if you like scary golem stories, but it was nicely done for children's theater. I'm giving it a happy face minus. I like the scarier, darker stuff better. At the Park Avenue Armory is Odin von Hovar's 1937 play Judgment Day, adapted by Christopher Shin and beautifully directed by Richard Jones from England. It takes place in a German-speaking town in 1937 where station master Thomas Hudetz is distracted by a playful kiss from Anna, the innkeeper's daughter. This is observed by his wife, Frau Hudetz, who's insanely jealous. And as a consequence of this impulsive action, Thomas fails to signal an express train which crashes into another train, killing 18 people. 
at first the townspeople are totally on his side and they're like, you know, and when his wife says, no, she speaks the truth and say, no, he did not signal in time, they vilify her and her brother, the pharmacist. And well, but again, it's like she does speak the truth, but she does it from such a malicious reason. See, everyone hates this woman and you hated her too, but I never, I never got why they hate her so much. Well, because she's completely bitchy and totally no. controlling his life. He's miserably unhappy with her. But we don't and get that. All these, you do, uh, Eva. No, all you didn't the, get it, no, but everybody because, else did. Yeah, no, uh, their only thing against her, as far as I could see, is that she's 17 years older than 13, him. 13. And, but, and seduced um, him into marrying her. So it's like, it's like well, no, let's get the old lady. It was like no, very anti-female, I felt. Well, it, I might agree with you on that, but she is constantly, you know, like, working uh, to destroy him. And she, you know, like, even she mentions that, you know, when she's in bed with him, she hates him. And, you know, like, everybody in this town is pretty much malicious, except her brother seems to be the only decent person there. Yeah, it makes you think about, you know, because this take took place right before Hitler time. But this well, is during a, Hitler time. And it's got an amazing cast. Jason O'Connor's yes. got a small part. Harriet Harris, um, Henry Strom. I mean, this is really... Alex Brew. It's brilliant. Brew? This is so well done. I, and Richard Jones is one of the best and directors. And the set design. It, it's like amazingly visual, incredibly expressionistic. It, it's a real treat, although a poison treat. This is Jan Ewing's review of Epic Players, Peter and the Star Catcher. It's by Rick Elise Book and Wayne Barker Music. It's a prequel to J.M. Barry's Peter Pan. It's based on the contemporary novel of the same name by Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson. This play with music tells the story of three orphans, Prentice, Ted, and Boyd, who is never given a name, bereft of friends and family who are kidnapped by an unscrupulous ship's captain who intends to sell them into slavery. Imprisoned in a ship's dungeon well below the waterline, they meet young Molly, the daughter of Lord Astor, whom Queen Victoria has tasked with transporting a chest of invaluable star stuff to a safe haven. Molly helps them escape, and together they embark upon a quest adventure, protecting the star stuff as they go to sea. Fight pirates, dodge mermaids, and eventually arrive at an island they name Never Never Land. Land, where the star stuff escapes to the sea and creates a magical realm allowing Boy to become who he was always destined to be, Peter Pan, the boy who won't grow up. The joint commitment of the epic players are infectious. I don't know, this is Jan, I don't know when I've seen so many people at such a good time. All in all, the energetic exuberance of this group is something everyone can enjoy and appreciate. Epic Players is a non-profit, neuro-inclusive theater company dedicated to creating professional performing arts opportunity and supportive social communities to the arts for persons living with developmental abilities. Take Your Kids as a production with ages, happy face, way more on Facebook. But I love the Epic Players. They did a great job at Little Stop of Horrors, too. At the underground cabaret space, The Secret Room, you could see Truffles, Music, Mushrooms, Murder, which is a really sort of stupid murder mystery, <laughs> but with a very enthusiastic cast and some wacky, again, hammy songs. The food is great. The atmosphere is a lot of fun. It's a really great cabaret space. So, um, you know, it's like an enjoyable evening of dinner theater with probably the emphasis more on the dinner. And we'll talk more on our next show, but, you know, it's only on Saturday, so look at, check it out. We'll have it on Facebook. It's a page. day treat. The Wonderful Winter Rhythms is back at Urban Stages, and they're helping out with Urban Stages' uh, educational program. It's a, a ghost of cabaret, and I went to the opening with an evening with Richard Skipper. Richard Skipper has this wonderful Richard Skipper Celebrates because he's the most celebratory person I know, and it's about his going from Conway, South Carolina, and his... Uh, ending up in New York City being the fabulous person he is. And it closes tonight at 6 o'clock with more Songs of Hope with the Calvacate of Cabaret people. And it's always a happy face. It just puts, it just, again, something to put you in the holiday spirit. And we just love it to pieces. William Cataldi saw The Straits, which is an ironic title since it's a play steeped in queer theory. It involves a... Um, road trip by Nina and Phoebe across the country to visit friends and they pick up a younger hitchhiker who may 
be a minor and who seems to be non-binary. When they reach their friend's place, it uh, reaches a crescendo and he's not going to give the um, end away, but he felt it's a sensitive and critical play, not the slightest bit self-indulgent, happy face plus with a lot more on Facebook. At Playwrights Horizons is Lucas Nass, The Thin Place, directed by Les Waters. Uh, it's this really scary, creepy, psychic thriller where um, Hilda is taught by her grandmother how to, like, read minds and look behind her eyes. And so when her grandmother dies, she goes to a real psychic, Linda, and they develop this weird relationship. And she becomes part of the inner circle of her cousin, Jerry, and this benefactor, Sylvia. I mean, it's fascinating. We're going to talk about it more on our next show because it's going on until January 5th, but I really like this a lot. I didn't think it was scary enough. I gave it Happy Face Plus. Obviously, Mark meant Mixed Face Plus, but maybe subconsciously he did like it. Ha, 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 ha. And he's not here to argue with me. Ha, 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 ha. Another Christmas Carol in Harlem. Closing December 22nd. Some shows we talked about and didn't talk about. And there's two little women's going on in Brooklyn. One is the play and one is the musical at the Gallery Players. And go to Eva Heinemann YouTube or Facebook page for the press conference and musical numbers from Anything That Happened. Uh, Paper Mill Playhouse is Cinderella. It's closing December 29th, and Gospel of John, we're seeing it December 19th, so look for the review on the Facebook page. And closing January 5th, Last Chance to be Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, and the Christmas Carol, which is like the best Christmas Carol in the Thin Place. And our dear dead, our dear dead drug lord is back. And going on Carnegie Hall tonight is Carpathia Jenkins and Tony Tassar singing Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald Christmas tunes. So that should be wonderful at 8 o'clock tonight. Broadway Con is back January 24th and 22nd. And a menagerie of mechanical marvels January 5th at New Victory. And there's nothing more festive than going to a cabaret at Christmas time and Hanukkah. And there's plenty to choose from. Hoping to see pockets and definitely seeing Ingenue about Deanna Durbin. Christmas and Nikki Land at La Mama is a holiday favorite. Not cracked at the flea. And the Irish ship has Pump Girl and London Assurance. These you can see on our Facebook page. They've closed. Forgot to mention the lyrics of Michael Colby are going to be sung by Maureen Taylor. End of the month at Don't Tell Mamas. And don't forget to pick up your Performing Arts Insider, Cultural Heartbeat of New York City, next show January 4th. And, um, and there's an interview with Michael Colby on, on YouTube. 